Well, I wonder how many of you find that you have some growing habits. Is anybody moving forward spiritually at our churches? I'm, I, uh, I hear a lot of good reports. Last week we baptized, and it's pretty amazing that we had uh, we had 1,200 people signed up to be baptized. We ended up baptizing about 1,500 people last week. If you can imagine, just several hundred people just couldn't help but spontaneously say yes and be obedient to, uh, to God's call to, to publicly stand up and say, my old life is gone. I am new in Christ. So congratulations to every single one of you. Uh, perhaps you're new with us. We are in a message series called Habits. We're talking about establishing the correct habits that would lead to the life that God wants to have for us. If you missed previous weeks, uh, I've referenced a book that I enjoyed a lot. In fact, I'm going to interview the author, J James Clear, uh, on my podcast. The name of his book is Atomic Habits. In the book, uh, the author says that most of us have very similar goals in life. I never really thought of that before, but if we just interviewed 100 people, most all of us want to be in good physical health. Most of us want to be strong financially. Most of us want to have good relationships. If we're Jesus followers, we want to be close to God. We want to reflect his love. We want to make a difference in the world. Most of us have very similar goals, but you have to agree that we have very, very, very different results in those goals. We're talking about how do we close that gap. When you think about it, nobody has real negative goals. I don't know anybody who says, what I would really like to do is live paycheck to paycheck for the rest of my life right? I want to be stressed financially. I love fights. You spent what on what? I told you not to do that. I want to be stressed financially. I don't know anybody who says I want to battle with my weight. I want to have health issues for my entire life. I want to die young and miss my grandkids growing up. I don't know anybody who says my goal is to become a raging addict. I'm addicted to something. I can't overcome it. It steals my family, steals my joy. I lose a relationship with my kids. Let's not even be so dramatic for a moment. Let's just kind of be a little more subtle in our illustration. I don't know anybody who says, I want to live a boring life. I want to just have a mundane existence. I want to be in a job that doesn't challenge me, one that I don't really like. I want to get toward the end of my life, and I want to say, I really didn't accomplish much, and the only thing I really have is a bunch of regrets. I don't know anybody who does that, and yet so many people end up at these places all the time. How do they end up there? I hope you'll notice and recognize that very few people wreck, hurt, and destroy their lives with one bad decision. Most people do it one small decision, one step, one day, one bad habit at a time. What's really fascinating to me is you might summarize a destructive life with one sentence, you know how it goes, uh, well, she got addicted and she ended up cheating on him and they ended up divorcing. That's one sentence description. He never followed through on his commitments and so they fired him. One sentence description. Uh, he always battled with his weight and he ended up dying at the age of 58. One sentence describing years and years and years. But it's never or rarely just one bad decision. Almost every time, it's a series of small steps, one day at a time, one bad habit at a time. I like in the Bible when you do see those summary sentences. I'll show you one that's always intrigued me. Um, in Judges chapter 16, there's a summary sentence of Samson. If you don't know Samson's story, this was a guy with incredible potential, with massive gifts and opportunities by God, from God, and one bad decision at a time, his life unraveled into a very unhappy ending. There's one sentence that says this, Judges 16, one says, one day, everybody say one day. one day. One day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. One sentence gives you a window into a series of decisions that ended up being bad habits that led to step after step into a lifetime of complete destruction. One day, one summary sentence, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. This may not make a lot of sense to people when you read this, but Gaza was a city that was 25 miles from Samson's hometown of Zora. Gaza was uh, the Philistine headquarters where Samson was public enemy number one. Uh, there was no such thing as Uber. 
whenever Samson was around. So it's very likely by foot, perhaps, Samson traveled 25 miles into enemy territory to risk his life to get a little um, action from a prostitute. Who in the world would risk so much for so little in return? And the answer is, people do it all the time. One summary sentence illustrates a lifetime of bad choices and bad habits. In fact, I did a little research. How many steps do you think it takes to walk 25 miles? Since I only work on Sundays and occasionally Saturdays, and I have nothing else to do during the week, I just did some research to find out how many steps it takes. And the answer is it takes approximately 56,250 steps to walk 25 miles. Think about this. How did Samson mess up his life? You could say he did it. One step, one bad decision, one day, one habit at a time. 56,250 steps that led to bad mindsets, bad habits, bad relationships, bad decisions, and an entire life of destruction. Very few people end up in a bad place because of one bad decision. Most of us do it one step at a time. If you've missed previous weeks, what we're talking about in this series is becoming who God is calling us to become. Before we start with the do, what we want to do is start with the who. Who is it that God wants you to be? A godly dad, a godly wife, a great example, uh, a mentor, uh, someone who's clean, someone who's sober, someone who's strong, someone who's a light in this world, someone who's healthy, someone who's fit, someone who's financially strong and generous. Who is it that God wants you to become? If you were with us last week, we answered one question, week one, who does God want you to become? Last week, based on who God wants you to become, what habit do you need to start? What habit? One small step in the direction that God is calling you. Today, we're going to add one more small layer to it that we can become conformed to the image of Christ and become who God wants us to become. The question and application thought for today is this. Based on who you want to become, what habit do you need to break? Last week, based on who you want to become, what do you need to start? Today, we want to talk about what do you need to break? If you need a verse that's in your face, James chapter 1, verse 21 says this. So get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. Submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your hearts who is able to save you. You want to be free. You want to be whole. You want to be all that God wants you to be. If there's a filthy habit, an unhealthy habit, an ungodly habit, get rid of that. Submit to God. Accept his word and become who he wants you to become. How are we going to do it? How are we going to rid ourselves of those little habits that take us to places we'd never want to go? Before we talk about how, let's talk about acknowledging whatever the one habit is that we want to break. And again, let me be very clear. You, many of us, we say, well, I've got like about, oh, probably 73 <laughs> that I need to break. We're not going to try to break 73. We're not even going to try to break five. We're not even going to try to break three. We're going to submit one habit that's taking us in the wrong direction to the Spirit of God and let him lead us. What is the one that you want God's help to break? It could be an attitude. You might have a complaining spirit. Everything is negative. I don't like this. I don't like them. I don't like them. It, it could be a negative heart. It could be a gossiping tongue. I know for you it's not gossip. You're just telling people so they can pray about it. I know, I know, I know you're so holy, but whatever it is, it could be, it could be um, a, an eating issue that you overeat, over snack, eat the wrong kinds of food. It could be perhaps um, a digital addiction for you, it's video games, or it could be social media, scroll, scroll, click, click. It could be that you binge watch too much TV. It could be that you're addicted to pornography. It could be that you're simply addicted to your mobile device that you can't go hardly any time at all without it. And if someone takes it, you feel like your life is, ah, ah, come back. That's a part of who I am. It could be a substance. You're addicted to sugar. It could be to nicotine. 
It could be to prescription uh, medication. It could be to alcohol. I had a seminary professor tell me years ago, I never will forget it. He said, if, if more than one person that loves you tells you that you have a problem, you likely have a problem. Yeah. Let me just say this to you all today. If more than one person who loves you tells you you have a problem with something, chances are you have a problem with something. What is the one habit that you want God's help to break? I'll tell you what I'm doing this year is I am uh, dramatically cutting my screen time ever since Apple came out and said, here's how much time you're staring at a stupid screen. I'm now putting limitations on my apps. Why? Because my life is too valuable, my calling too good. To waste my life staring at a stupid screen, I'm putting limitations. I'm not going to let that dominate me. What is it for you? Why is it that it's difficult to break bad habits? Let's talk about it, and then we're going to talk about how. Here's the challenge with both good and bad habits. Let's start with the good. Here's the challenge with the good. When you're starting a good habit, it's difficult at first, and the payoff isn't until somewhere in the future. Have you noticed that? For example, I want to go jogging, and so I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to go jogging, and my alarm goes eh, 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 early in the morning, like, oh, it's so early, I didn't realize it's so early, and then you go out and it's cold, and then your muscles ache, and then you go all week long and nothing happens. It's hard at the beginning, and the payoff isn't until seven months later, you're down 11 pounds, and you've got what looks like the beginning stages of buns of steel. <laughs> but it takes a while, doesn't it? It's difficult at the beginning, but the payoff's later. Same with going to church. I'm going to arrange my schedule. I'm going to go to church this weekend, and it's good, but your life doesn't change immediately. And so next weekend is hard, and you want to sleep in, and there's a game. And there's all these different obstacles that keep you away from there. And it's not until months later when suddenly you realize, my faith is now stronger, and I've got a peace, and I've got friendships, and I've got support around me, and I've got godly people praying for me, and I'm using my gifts, and I'm making a difference. That doesn't happen in a week. It takes time, and then you start seeing the benefits. The bad habits, though, they're the opposite. It's the flip side. The good ones are difficult with the payoff way out there. The bad ones, let's be honest, they're fun at first. Sin can be fun. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. I'm not admitting that in church. No, no. It can be fun. If you don't think sin is fun, either you didn't do it right or you're lying, right? It can be fun for a little while until it's not, until it messes you up. Bad habits, they're fun at first, and the bad payoff's not until the future. I was talking about smoking ciggies a few weeks ago, and everybody's laughing at me. I didn't know why they're laughing at me. I thought they were laughing because nobody calls it ciggies. Like, I'm not in the ciggy club. I didn't realize they were laughing because I said smoking ciggies. And someone after said, this is not how you smoke a ciggy. <laughs> the smoking police are all up into my business. So just so you'll know, I mean, I, I just don't, I, if you're smoking a ciggy, you, <laughs> you get... You get the nicotine hit, the rush, the relax, whatever. It's not until maybe decades later that you find out your lungs are in great trouble, right? It's fun at first, and then there's a payoff. Uh, let's take uh, the all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> it's really fun to go there and see all the pictures of everything on the wall, isn't it? But then what, you know, your little uh, banana pudding with the little wafer thingies? that you eat. Can you guys turn the lights back on for me if it's possible? You eat the little banana wafer thingies, and that's fun for a little while until years later you get the bad news that you've got type 2 diabetes. The payoff is later on in the future. How is it that we break the habits that lead us in the wrong direction? Let's talk about how you do it. If you're with us last week on the good habits, what do we do? We make it obvious and we make it easy. Do you remember last week? Make it obvious and make it easy. This week to break a bad habit, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it difficult to do. We're gonna make it difficult to do. The reason we need to make it difficult to do is because by choice alone, 
We can't stay away from temptation forever. You may have willpower, but you only have so much willpower. Willpower is like energy. It gets depleted over time. And you know this because if they bring donuts into your workplace and you're avoiding donuts, you can walk by that thing with power, strength, and confidence one time, two times, three times. On the fourth time, you say, I surrender, and you eat only a half a donut. And you tell you yourself it's okay. And you wait a full five minutes before you eat the other half, pretending as if it's not a whole because it was two halves. And then since you lost your donut virginity, you eat four before the end of the day. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? That's why what we're going to do is we're going to make it difficult to do. I love what Solomon says about dangerous paths. He says, don't set a foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. And then he gives you some advice. He says it four times. In other words, if you're not listening the first time, I'll say it three more times just to make sure that you understand. He says, avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. Go your own way. Don't get close to it. Run away from it. Make it hard to do and get your tail out of dodge. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make it difficult to do the bad habits to give us separation between our addiction, God renewing our mind and replacing it with something that is so much more healthy. If you were with us last week, we looked at the habit loop. Let me show it to you again. What happens is again and again in your life, there's something that triggers you. It leads to an action and then you get a reward and you do again and again and again. What we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about removing the trigger and we're gonna talk about interrupting the action. Whatever the trigger is that leads you to an unhealthy action, we're going to try our best to remove the trigger. I hope this is helpful to you. This is very helpful to me. What are the major triggers? There are so many different triggers in life, but experts will tell you there are five major triggers. What are they? You can be triggered by a place. You can be triggered at a certain time. You can be triggered by a mood. You can be triggered by a moment. You can be triggered by people, a place, a time, a mood, a moment, or people. We're going to try to remove the trigger. Let's talk about place and time. There are certain places where you will do the wrong habits and certain places you will not do the wrong habits. For example, you probably don't overeat when you're at the gym. You probably don't get high when you're at church. As a side note, if you do get high while you're at church, let me advise you to not do that while you're at church. But there are other places where you might overeat and you might get high, which might be at a Super Bowl party with all the wrong kind of people. You might overeat and you might get high. You do both those things because you're at the wrong place. There's also a time. For example, chances are pretty good you don't look at pornography when you're at Life Group. Would that make sense? Yeah. You might look at pornography when you're alone late at night, maybe you're angry, Maybe you feel hurt in some sort of way. Time and place matter. There's a powerful example of a guy who loved God desperately with his heart. He was the king of Israel, King David. He was a guy that was very, very much in love with God. But he made one horrible decision that led to another, and it was all about wrong time, wrong place. Where was he? He was at home in his palace when he should have been in battle. In fact, if you read the story, it says, in the springtime, when kings went off to war, this king was not where he was supposed to be. Then he went at a time he wasn't supposed to, to the top of his palace that happened to be his neighbor's bath time. There's no other way to say it. He saw her, he asked someone to go get her, he ended up committing adultery with her, which led to the murder of her husband and a series of other bad, bad things. What would happen? Wrong place, wrong time. He wasn't where he was supposed to see. He saw something he wasn't supposed to see. He did something he wasn't supposed to do. It cost him something that he never wanted to lose. Wrong place, wrong time. If we know there's a place whenever I'm there, if we know there's a time whenever I'm more vulnerable, I want to get out of that place. I want to have something else for that time. I'm going to do everything I can to kill and remove that trigger. Let's talk about the mood. When are we most vulnerable? Again, people who write on the subject, they, they'll say you're vulnerable at the halt. H-A-L-T, halt. Halt is when you're hungry, 
when you're hungry, oh man, when I'm hungry, low blood sugar, okay? And then A stands for angry. Amy says in our house, there's not three, four moods, there's three. Hungry and angry go together for me and is hangry. You're hangry, Craig, you're hangry, okay? L stands for lonely. When you're lonely or when you're bored, you're vulnerable. And T stands for tired. If we see this is a time where my mood makes me vulnerable to a bad habit, I want to do something that changes my mood. I want to be out of the time or the specific place where I'm vulnerable. I recognize these can be triggers, and therefore I'm going to try to remove the trigger. There are moments. There are moments when something happens when you're vulnerable. Sometimes you're vulnerable after a win in life. Sometimes you're vulnerable after a loss in life. And it's after that moment, that incident, that action, that you tend to do the same thing. After a fight with your husband, you get upset, and you almost always call the same three girlfriends, and you will have a husband bashing party. That's the trigger that takes place. Um, it's, you go to the game with all your buddies, and at the game, you always drink too much. That's the event followed by the action. Uh, you flunk your test, so you smoke weed. Or you pass your test, and you smoke weed. Or you skip your test, and you smoke weed. Whatever it is, okay, you've got a weed problem. What you're doing is you're looking for that moment that leads you to the action that you don't want to have, and we're going to try to remove that trigger from our lives. Let me talk for just a moment about people. This is so, so, so important. It is impossible to overstate how important the people are in your life. In fact, studies are conclusive. The closer you are to someone, the more likely you are to have similar habits in your life. There's one study that's fascinating. They tracked 12,000 people over a 32-year period. And what they found is so, so interesting. Among so many other things, they found that your chances of becoming obese increased by 57% if you have one close friend who's also obese. The flip side is true. If any one person loses a significant amount of weight, one third of the people close to that person will also lose a significant amount of weight because the people around you influence the habits that you have. Solomon said this a long time before studies were around. He said in Proverbs 13, walk with the wise and you become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Let me tell you about my friends, my closest friends. I'm so excited to tell you that my closest friends are people of integrity. They all love Jesus. They're all plugged into the church. To be real honest, they actually all eat really good. They all exercise. They all live beneath their means financially. They're all incredibly generous. And truthfully, my closest friends, they have good, strong marriages. How much easier do you think it is for me to be around people living the life that I want to live, to have some of the habits consistent with them, to bring about a life that is honoring to God. Think for a moment, if my closest friends were all unemployed, all addicted to video games, all were porn addicts, all were in massive debt, and all invited me to go to the casino every week to smoke Siggy's or Siggy's your choice. <laughs> Think about how much more difficult it would be for me to live a life that would truly honor God. And what I'm not saying is that we don't love all people, reach out to all people, be a light to all people, but Paul said it very, very boldly. He said, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. The people you have around you matter so much. How do we break a habit? What we're going to do is we're going to try to remove the trigger, and we're going to try to interrupt the action. Whenever we know this is a person, this is a place, this is a time, this is a moment, this is a mood that tends to get me in trouble, I want to distance myself from that trigger. And if I can't get myself out of the trigger, when I'm moving toward the action, I want something that slows me down to keep me from doing the action. Let me give you some examples. I heard last week that we've got a lot of people that are no longer snoozers in the morning. For the glory of God, when your alarm goes off, you attack the day. 
God has called you. He's given you a day to use for his glory. And therefore, you're not going to bop, 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 bop four times. If this is a weakness for you, here's what you're going to do. You're going to make it more difficult to hit that snooze button. Take your clock or your mobile device and put it way across the room. And when it goes off in the morning, you got to get your butt out of bed all the way to go over there to turn it out. What did you just do? You removed, you separated yourself from the action. You slowed yourself down. Maybe you're overspending on Amazon. I mean, you talk about danger. Click, click. There it was again. Click, click. I just saw something again. And that's it. So you might give your password to a close friend and you can't buy anything without your close friend helping you. What did you just do? You removed the trigger and you broke the action. You can't stop looking at porn. What are you going to do? You're going to get serious about it. It, it. You haven't defeated it yet with your own plan. If what you tried hadn't worked, what are you going to do? You're going to get serious. You're going to block whatever is dating. On your phone, you may not have Safari anymore. Or you're going to limit adult content. Or you're not going to have Instagram. You may not have the ability to download apps. And if you're smart enough to get around every block that you can create, you've been demoted to a dumb phone. <laughs> because you're not going to let some lustful images and a habit that breaks the heart of God and dishonors people keep you from becoming the person that God wants you to become. You're removing the trigger and you're breaking the action. Some of you, let me be honest, it's going to take some severe measures. Some of the more serious addictions, I mean, i got some of the best, best and boldest people who sit with me at this service, gambling or, or drug addiction or alcohol or, or, or sexual stuff. Man, you just pick up and you go to rehab. Yeah. What you're going to do is you're going to do whatever it takes to separate yourself from the temptation. Let me hear you. Let me, let me just tell you. Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. He always gives you a way out. People don't mess up their life generally with one big bad decision. Most of the time, it's one decision, one step, one habit, one day at a time. I hope you'll feel this. The habits you have today will shape who you become tomorrow. Question, are your habits taking you in the direction you want to go? Play it forward. The good ones, they're difficult now. You're not going to see the payoff until later. You're debt free. You've gone from a 38 down to a 34 waist. Your marriage is now stronger than ever before. You're making a difference. You've got an ongoing peace. The payoff takes time. The bad habits, it's fun now. But the destruction isn't until later. Play it out. If you've got a bad habit, play it out. Play it out. And realize one day what you might say, and you know it. You might say, I never thought I'd end up here. I never thought this would rob me from the relationships from the people that I love the most. I never thought that this would end up being my biggest regret. I mean, I, I, I thought I could overcome it. I can't believe that I ended up here now. Play it forward. Because your habits compound over time. Remove the trigger. I feel so weak. I feel so weak. I feel so weak. I feel so weak. Listen, Christ, his strength is enough. When you are weak... His strength is made perfect. I always tell myself this. Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. Christ's power is made perfect when I am weak. When I think about Samson, what's so powerful to me to think about is 56,250 steps in the wrong direction. And think about this. What else did he have? He had 56 1,250 opportunities to stop and to turn around. 56,250 chances to say, this isn't the life I want to live. This isn't the story I want to tell. This isn't the direction that I want to go. 
Oh, it seemed right in that moment, but I'm stopping. God has called me to something more. One by one, little decision by little decision. They start to compound over time. And you say, but it doesn't seem very big. No, scripture says, Zechariah says this, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Why? Because scripture says, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. What I love the thought of is God in heaven going, yeah, you did it. One small decision in the right direction. Way to go. The Lord rejoicing over you. You said no to that today. You did the right thing today. And the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Then when you start living according to God's plan, it's not something that you're doing, but it's changing who you are. You see it. When you wake up early and you seek God in his word, you're not just someone who did an action. You are a disciple of Jesus, growing closer to him. When you eat right, suddenly you're, I am a healthy person doing what is, when you go and run, I'm an athlete who's doing this for the glory of God. And suddenly one small habit at a time, you start to realize because Christ is in me, I am a self-discipline, devil kicking, mountain moving, light shining, spirit filled, overcomer by the blood of the lamb and by the words of my testimony. And you may not get there today, but do not grow weary, Scripture says, in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Do not despise the day of these small beginnings. Imagine our God, your God, rejoicing over you because he saw the work begin. Father, today we ask you to direct our thoughts toward one bad, unhealthy habit that you want to help us break. God, based on who we want to become, give us the power, the honesty to tell the truth, to take it before you, knowing we may not be perfect, but we are being perfected by your word and by your presence. All of our churches, you'll seek him, You'll name it, you'll confess it to the right people, and he will help you break it. You're in at all of our churches, you'll say, yes, I'll seek him for that. Would you lift up your hands right now? Just all of our different churches, all of our different churches. Go ahead and put your hands down for a minute. I want you to think about what's possible. Last week, you're starting something. This week, you're stopping. Small beginnings. The work has begun. You're being conformed to the image of Christ. God, help us by your power. When we're weak, when we're vulnerable, God, keep us strong. God, give us the wisdom to stay away from the triggers that lead us, tempt us, put us in an environment where we're more vulnerable. God, if we fail, we thank you that there's grace to begin again. 56,250 steps and even a lot more in your kingdom to say this isn't the direction I want to go. God, lead us in the way of everlasting. As you keep praying today at all of our different churches, um, there are those of you, if we're talking about stopping, there's something you need to stop when it comes to God. You've been making excuses, and you've been delaying your decision to give your life completely to him. At all of our churches, there are those of you, you recognize you're doing life without the power of God, without his grace without his spirit that's available to you. Again, we have to start by acknowledging our need. What's our need? The reality is we have all sinned, every single one of us. You know it, you've messed up, I've messed up. You feel guilty for it sometimes. We cannot work our way to God. We can't be holy enough for God on our own. You can't be religious enough, it's, it's impossible. And that's why God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He became one of us in the person of his son, Jesus, Jesus the Son of God, the Lamb of God, perfect in every way. He died on a cross in our place for the forgiveness of sins. Our God raised Jesus from the dead so that anyone, and this does include you, no matter what you've done, no matter how dark your life is, anyone who calls on the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, that person would be saved, that person would be forgiven. You would be spiritually healed, you would be made new. At all of our churches, 
you've been putting it off, you've been kicking the tires, maybe you're even here for the first time and you recognize, this is it, I need it, I need Jesus. Today, I give my life to him. Today, I surrender completely to Jesus. No more waiting, no more excuses, I give my life to him. That's your prayer, lift your hands high. Now, all over the place, lift them up, right up here, praise God for you. Right back over here in this section, others today say, yes, Jesus, I surrender. Right back over here in this section, praise God. We thank God for you, church online. You click right below me, and together we're all going to unite our voices and pray. Would you pray with those around you? Pray, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Forgive all my sins. Jesus, save me. Make me new. Holy Spirit, fill me with your power so I can walk in your ways. My life is not mine. I give it all to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you guys worship big right now? Would you welcome those born into God's family?